The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You've always got time for short time. Hey, it's Warren Lopez. David Taylor. Fred Metcalf. Johnny Hendricks. Tony Ramos. Bubba J. Mike Gold. Matthew Modine. The one and only Chael Sonnen. And you are listening to the one and only Short Time Wrestling Podcast by the often imitated and never duplicated Jason Bryant. Episode 290 of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. And on this show, we've talked to Olympic champions, we've talked to national champions, we've talked to people that are in the sport of wrestling and have been in the sport of wrestling, but today our guest is Don Sianga, one of the wrestling historians that, uh, you know, in our day of the internet, we don't really focus on the written word as much, and Don has been basically writing about wrestling, documenting, and I guess for lack of a better word, he is one of our great historians in the sport of wrestling. And first of all, before we get into his background, Don, I want to welcome you to the program. It is a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I'm pleased to be uh, on your program, Jason. I really admire your work. Well, uh, that that's definitely going the other way here, because when I go back and look at the stacks of stuff, I mean, I've got a pile of amateur wrestling news. As a matter of fact, they're not, they're not a pile. They are bound and filed by date going back to the 50s and your name is all through amateur wrestling news which for the longest time was the only way people were getting wrestling coverage but i want to get back before we even get into that before we get into your career as a wrestler what made you first uh fall in love with the sport of wrestling as an athlete um this is uh, a very interesting i i think but much different than the usual story and uh, I like to tell it because it, of the way it happened. But um, it was a case of a pure chance. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, at a time when the public school system did not permit high school wrestling in Pittsburgh. So when uh, I got to the point where I was going to college, I had never seen it, had no idea what it was. And... I uh, was very lucky to get a grant to go to Lafayette College, uh, which was a school where back in the 1920s, they had a superb football team, really uh, top rank football team. And the year that I was a senior in high school, Lafayette lost every game. It's the only time they ever lost every game. And the alumni from back in the 20s, 30s, and 40s were not happy, as you can imagine. So uh, what they did was they fired the coach. They hired an NFL player by the name of Steve Hokuf, who had been a coach several places, to come in and, and basically start football from scratch. But they hired him uh, in the summertime. Uh, all of the really good Football players were already committed and off to school by the time he was on board. So here's this guy, um, an exceptional football player himself, who is uh, now taking over the coaching duties at a school where they've lost every game. He had a whole bunch of free grants and nobody to give them to. And somebody told an alumni group in Pittsburgh that they were to submit any name they could think of to him. And my name got submitted, even though I was not very much of a football player in high school. And we had, if our team was barely better than the Lafayette team. I think we won one game while I was in high school. So <clears throat> I um, went down to Lafayette for what was called a tryout. Uh, the, uh, the whole idea of it was that he invited all sorts of kids to come there and and tried to to um, disperse this grant money that he had to the best chances he could find to put a team together. Well, as it turned out, I had taken, while I was in high school, I had taken a, a test. I don't know if it's still around, but it was called the West Point physical aptitude test and it was a supposedly a measure of how well you were adapted to uh, sports as they were in America my 
problem is I was not very much involved with sports because uh, my vision is so bad. And I had uh, run track in high school, and that's about it. But anyway, I had a really good score on this test. And uh, so on the strength of that score, I ended up uh, going to Lafayette College to play football, a sport which I uh, really didn't know very much about and wasn't very good at. And at a time when I had never seen wrestling, did not know what college wrestling was at all. Uh, at the end of the first football season, the freshmen could, in those days couldn't do varsity, you know. Uh, at the end of the first football season, I was down in the gym one day, and I was approached by a guy who became a very close friend of mine named Ralph Hutchison. He was a New Jersey State High School champion in the early 50s. And he approached me and told me that uh, Lafayette had a wrestling team, but they, there was nobody in school that was uh, qualified to wrestle for the team that weighed over 170 pounds. And what they had been doing was when they went to dual meets, they put a 167-pounder up at, at heavyweight because they hadn't, didn't have anybody else. And he said, you know, I can, I think I can teach you enough wrestling to have you give it a try. Why don't you try out for the team? Uh, well, never having seen it before, and I figured, what the heck. So I went to the wrestling room, and it pretty much happened just like that. But the fa interesting facet, to me is interesting, is that he convinced me to do that based on the idea that Lafayette was forfeiting heavyweight. And he said, if we can teach you to stay off your back, you'll save a team point. It doesn't matter if you get beat, but you'll save a team point because getting pinned is not as bad as forfeiting. So when, when I uh, first learned the sport... I learned it from the direction of the pin only. Everything that I did at the beginning was all related to getting a fall or not giving up a fall. And so my attitude or stance about the sport was really different from anybody, I would say, that had been experienced with high school wrestling because I didn't know any of the other maneuvers. I, I had no idea what to do, but I did learn very quickly how to stay off my back and I also learned how to put other people on their back, and that um, I found very natural. So for me, for the first time, I was involved with a sport that I felt natural with and that didn't require me to have good vision. <laughs> and uh, that's how I got started in it, and, and I fell in love with it. Yeah, and we look at the you know the history that you know you and guys like Jay, the late Jay Hammond, and and the late Bob Dellinger had put together with this. I go back and I look through these results, and you know Jay Hammond's website still exists with WrestlingStats.com, and I, I was curious about this, so I look, and, and you wrestled at the Nationals in 1956 and in 1957, and so you're going to the Collegiate National Championships, which at the time was an open, but you'd only been wrestling your third year of actual wrestling was in college. And you're going to the national championships at Cornell. Let's 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 figure out what 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 possessed you to do that. Well, uh, I'll tell you, it, it uh, was it was fun. Um, Lafayette at that time there was a very active wrestling, small college wrestling league uh, called the Middle Atlantic League, and. I was lucky enough to be in school with, in addition to my friend Ralph Hutchison, Lafayette had, had um, uh, a guy by the name of Fred Braun, a 157-pounder, who was really good. Most of the time when I worked out, I worked out with Fred because he was a pinner. And he had the ability to uh, convey to you when he was going to attempt something, and he knew just about every pin that was in the book. So he taught me to be alert for what was coming. Well, by the time I was a senior, um, Lafayette's team was pretty good, and we won the Middle Atlantic Championship. And the school had no interest at all in the wrestling team, I would say, 
in any event, that was the end of it, my career after in my third year. But uh, the the students of uh, Lafayette got together and raised money to send three of us. Actually, I think four of us. Now that I think about it to the national championship in 56, which was at Oklahoma State. And what happened to me was that uh, the, the uh, volunteer coach at Lafayette called up Jerry Lehman, who was a coach at Lehigh, and asked him if we could come over there when the our season ended and begin to work out with the Lehigh team, which he agreed to readily. And so a group of us would go over there and practice with Lehigh. And Lehigh had rented a plane, a DC-3, to take the whole Lehigh team out to the Nationals at Stillwater. And there were empty seats on the plane. The end of the story is I went to the Nationals at Stillwater on the plane with the Lehigh team that I had been working out with. And although I got beat very easily when I was at Stillwater, I uh, got my love of the sport reinforced very strongly. And then a very curious thing happened. Two years later, I got a job in Tulsa. And when I was living in Tulsa, Tulsa YMCA had a program uh, run by a guy named Clay Roberts, and they were the national AAU team champs. Uh, he collected all of the really good college wrestlers from the local high schools and also from uh, Oklahoma A&M, as it was then called, and OU, and put them together for uh, an AAU team after college season ended. So I was living in a town where uh, it was a wrestling hotbed. I was involved with a sport that I loved very much. And the thing that struck me at the time was that I couldn't learn very much about it. The only, as you said a minute ago, the only publication that there was uh, was the one run by Jess Hoke out of Oklahoma City. Anyway, I was a traveling salesman, so on one of my trips to Oklahoma City, I walked in on Jeff just one time and said, I'd like to learn a lot more about the sport, and I'm subscribing to your magazine, but I wonder, can I get a hold of back issues, because I'd like to read everything. And he gave me some back issues, and then we got into a conversation, and I pointed out to him that it wasn't easy to learn the background of the sport, because with only one publication like his, there, and he was doing all the writing, by the way, uh, there, there wasn't um, there wasn't anybody doing research, Jason, about what it boils down to. And so uh, finally I said to him one day, you know, I'm t- traveling around and I think I'd like to stay active in this sport, but I'm in a position to do research. Uh, if I wrote up some articles that relate to the background of the sport and sent them to you, would you print them? And he said, you write it, I'll print it. <laughs> So with that, uh, my relationship with uh, Jess Hoke began. At the beginning, the most I could manage was like three paragraphs at a time. And if you look at that set you have, you'll see that my early adventures were extremely limited. But um, fast forward to the end of the story, uh, I went from that job traveling in the oil fields working out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, to a series of jobs that involved international travel. And when I got involved in international travel and traveling around the United States of America, I began to, I was single, I didn't have any family to go home to, and so it was fun for me to go into a library wherever I could find one and research and make notes, and that's how I got off and running. And I kept that up for an awful long time um when john john hoke took over uh i sat down with him and said i'd like to continue this and he said i hope you will and so my relationship with john 
uh, filled right in for the relationship I have with his father. Yeah, cause wonderful the, family, by the way, the whole family. What we have now is, you know, the series that you were you were building when I was working with the magazine for for eighteen months was was the Centenarian Files, and you're going back a hundred years, and then the 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 series that basically you really became known for in wrestling circles, the oldest sport. And I'm curious on how you basically wanted to say, I want to write. I mean, was there a a background in wanting to be a journalist or was it just something that, you know, there's an interest. I think I can, I want to write. I mean, how do you, how do you go from never wrestling before to now wanting to write about wrestling? Because this is, you know, I, I've kind of, I went from never wrestling before to wrestling to writing. So I'm, I, you know, granted years later, I'm just kind of curious on what, how your mind worked here to say, I, I think I want to start writing about this. Well, um, I think I alluded just a minute ago to the fact that I was traveling so much. I had no family to go home to. And um, I didn't want to end up an alcoholic, which is what happened to most traveling salesmen. Uh, so instead of uh, hanging out in a bar or cocktail lounge when I was not working, I started to go to libraries. I, I found in libraries all over the world, there is a reference librarian just sitting there waiting for somebody to come in and ask an interesting question. And once you uh, seek out those people, they'll they'll fall all over themselves to help you. So I developed a list of extremely helpful reference librarians at libraries in hundreds of places where if I was spending the night or spending the weekend, I'd go over there, and what I did at the beginning was just to take notes. But uh, And, of course, in those days, you know, we had no Internet, and we were using manual typewriters, and it's utterly different than it is today. But the idea of converting my notes into some written form was based solely on the idea that I had to write sales reports all the time. And so I developed uh, the ability to handle sentences primarily from writing sales reports. And I found it pretty easy to just substitute um, sports data in the play. I'm trained as an engineer, by the way. So I had no previous background at all in anything literary, but I found it relatively easy. And I I think I can say something that you probably know. The best way to learn about writing is just to write. Absolutely. And, and uh, the, the thing uh, that I'm, I, if I'm proud of anything, I'm proud of the fact that I tried to become a good critic of what I was doing so that every time I do something that didn't come out quite the way I wanted it to, I didn't hesitate to tear it down and rewrite it. And, and I still do that to this day. I rewrite constantly. But that, that's the background. That's how it how it happened. And, of course, traveling like that, it allowed me to go to tournaments, and and it also allowed me to do something else, which I, I'm remiss if I don't mention it. I, In addition to uh, being involved with the Tulsa YMCA team, I went to both uh, coaches at OU and at OSU, o- o- Oklahoma and m as it was then, and ask if they were interested in having an outsider heavyweight come in to give the heavyweight somebody to roll around with. And both of the coaches agreed. Port Robertson was the coach at OU, in particular agreed. And he um, he treated me like I was a member of the team. I don't know how he pulled it off, but I got a locker, and, and uh, the heavyweight they had at the time was a really good heavyweight by the name of Dale Lewis. He and I became very close friends. I uh, formed similar friendships with uh, heavyweights at other schools, Ronnie Scherf uh, at Pitt and Pete Davidson at Lehigh, and and I could recite maybe 12 more names of guys that later became my friends but began by being somebody that I rolled around with. So I was caught up not only in in my work with Jess Hoke writing about the sport, but I was also involved in the sport uh, all over the place. And, you know, it's funny how these things fall out sideways, but um, I just mentioned one thing. One day I got a, I got a letter from the Encyclopedia Britannica, and it was from one of the editors, and he said, 
we we want somebody to rewrite our article called wrestling and we ask around here in England and somebody said there's only one guy doing this kind of thing and he's in the USA Don Sanga find him <laughs> and so I ended up writing the article on wrestling in uh, in Encyclopedia Britannica just because of of this background that I'm giving you that's one of the stories that I was actually hoping you got to, and and it seems very, you know, your explanation seems really simple. But in the in an era where we're, you know, I remember growing up, in, you know, in in the eighties, you know, and, and even into the early nineties before the internet was still a thing. Each family seemed to have their own volume of encyclopedias. That was how we did research. That's how we did papers. Like, I want to do a top. I want to write a story about the Ukraine or something. You'd go to the encyclopedia, and it was either World Book or it was Britannica. And you, back in the day, people would actually sell encyclopedias, and they would you'd see the commercials on television. But you know, in that era, I mean, getting published in in, in an encyclopedia that's got to be one of those things. It's like. Wow, that doesn't happen to too many people, and you know, to be able to do it with wrestling, it's just got to be such a rush. Well, it, it definitely was that, no question about it. And it's interesting that here I am, eighty-two years old, and I'm still in contact with the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, one of the things that that's kind of um, that is different now. Let me say, and I'm going to try and put this in perspective. If you do a search today compared to the way it was then. The way it was then is exactly what you said. You'd either go to your family encyclopedia, which often is not was World Book because they sold cheaper than Encyclopedia Britannica, or you'd go to the library and pull it off the shelf. But that's the way you did it. Um, we lived in a world in which we were dependent upon what the authorities in those books told us was the fact. Now, what's changed today is the rise of uh, the whole wiki phenomenon. You know what I mean? The, the, if, you, if you do a search today on the Ukraine, and if you just type in Ukraine in a search block, you're gonna, the first hit you're going to get is Wikipedia. And Wikipedia brags about the fact that anybody can order the entry that appears online. Uh, that that makes it possible for them to draw in expertise from a much wider base. The downside is they draw in an awful lot of non-fact. And I one time, I had a foster brother who worked for the NSA in D.C. never told me what he did. Uh, he said, if I tell you what I do for a living, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one time I was visiting with him about the um, rapid advance of misinformation by way of the Internet. And I said to him, you know, I think half, I think half the information on the Internet is false. And he said... Wrong. It's more like 80% false. <laughs> and uh, that sunk in pretty deep because when you look at it, uh, and if you do know a subject, it, it really is uh, bothersome that there are an awful lot of false statements on there. But, but the uh, positive side of it, in my view, and I don't know how you feel about it, Jason, but I feel strongly about this, the good deal is the increased use of digitizing older documents, uh, which has become very commonplace now. And this allows people that have a deep interest in a given subject, and it doesn't matter whether it's uh, growing bananas or um, the political history of Slovenia or, or it can be any subject, but it allows them to draw out digitized older documents that help fill in vacancies in, in the factual record. And if I was, if I had just moved to Tulsa the way I did in 1958, if I'd just done that now, I'd, I'd be, um, I wouldn't be going to the libraries and I wouldn't be pulling down the encyclopedia volumes. I'd be doing it all online. Uh, when, when I got, uh, uh, you mentioned a second ago, the centenarian file idea that I had uh, 
give a report of what was going on 100 years ago. Once we got past 2003, uh, college wrestling 100 years ago was reportable. There were, there were only a dozen schools or more, but but it was reportable. And I thought we people today ought to know about that stuff because it was a sport that was started by kids, just like uh, like college football, same thing. It, college football has grown into this mega empire you know, from the NFL on down, but the whole thing was started by a bunch of kids. And so it seems to me that those kids deserve to have their stories told. That's how I feel. Yeah, and I look at it because I'm still relatively new when you think about it. I mean, I've been around the sport for, for 21, 22 years, and most of it in, in a media type of fashion. I mean, I started – watching wrestling at 15 uh, b- before I even stepped on the mat when I was 16. So uh, I'm going through and I'm looking back at NCAA championships that that were even just a few years before I started getting into it. So I'm looking at it from the mid 90s and the 80s and, you know, people that I've met over the years. And I'm like, I- I'll sit there and I'll think about it and I'll be like, oh, that's so and so. And then I'll be reading an old amateur wrestling news or to look up something completely random and I'll flip a page but oh I didn't know like you know Gary Taylor just announced his retirement at the end of the season from from Ryder University and then you'll flip through it and you'll see Gary Taylor wrestling for East Stroudsburg you know it's like oh that's coach Taylor you know you see all these connections to the past and what I really yeah. like looking through the historical pieces especially stuff that you write I pulled one out from 1977 and you were Actually, this was probably about 20 minutes before we started this interview, and it was, I believe, about a Greek named Dorzius. I'm not sure how you say his name, but I'm sitting there and I'm just reading this, and it's, I believe it was from you're, – you're documenting a story from 1914 about him wrestling a Navy man that the match – the only match he ever wrestled that didn't end by a fall. That type of story to me as a wrestling fan is fascinating. Well, that's a good example to, to pull out. He uh, was actually a – physically, he actually was a Greek from Greece. And Billy Sheridan, who was the coach at Lehigh for many, many years before I got involved, uh, I interviewed him one time, and we were talking about people from the past, and he said that man – was beyond question the strongest man that ever wrestled, and he did everything based on strength. Uh, and Billy lamented the fact that he didn't really know that much wrestling. Uh, that is, uh, Doresis didn't know that much wrestling, and Billy wished that he could have had contact with him at Lehigh instead of having him go to Penn because he would have taught him how to wrestle. Uh, but he said... He didn't really need to know because he was so silly strong. <laughs> the, uh, and if you look at that record, where um, I believe that's right, he pinned every man he wrestled, every man but one, I think. Uh, and the guy he didn't pin bragged about it. <laughs> but uh, it was it was done because he was uh, able to overcome anybody else's strength. So no matter what kind of a hold was involved. Uh, he could overcome it with strength. Well, I cite that as an example of the difference. I, I don't think he could have been that successful in the modern times. I think the sport is much faster now, much quicker than than it used to be. And I think somebody with a, with uh, the ability to match his strength to a degree, but with greater quickness, could probably defeat him today. But that would that would never have happened back then because the sport was so much slower. I want to jump ahead in something that was more in recent history. About five years ago, the display about the the artifact, the first textbook, as it was called, or first uh, brochure, or I don't know how you even want to describe it, that uh, manual, I guess actually would be the word, on how to wrestle. Uh, was was It was discovered in the 1800s, put on display at Columbia University in 2011, and it proves that wrestling is the oldest sport, uh, as this document goes back to uh, 100, 200 A.D., uh, kind of, I guess, was it first of all kind of fitting for you or kind of vindicating to know that there was actually now a document out there that validated the title of your long running column in amateur wrestling news? See, this is the oldest sport. Me and Alaverde were right. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Well, the, I have to say that um, 
I, after I got going on this, I bumped into the validation of that um, again and again and again. And the one thing that I always point out to people when we're having a discussion like the one you and I are having is this is the only sport or one of, let's say, one of very few sports which is found all over the world in civilizations everywhere at the beginning of recorded history. And what that says to me is that it had evolved considerably before the idea of keeping historical documents began. So when you, when you think about um, uh, a good example is the uh, Judeo-Christian Bible. Uh, there are, in the oldest books of the Judeo-Christian Bible, there are numerous places where the King James translators use the word wrestling, because whatever the older document, whatever language it was written in, it was clear to them that what was being referenced was wrestling, clearly wrestling. And they used the word wrestling because the readers, everybody knew what that meant. So here we have a concept of a sport that is so deeply ingrained in human culture that it goes back beyond anybody's attempt to discover what the cultural origin of it originally was. I don't have a clue how it began. I, I've often thought that it it's a, re, really a very primitive and fundamental um, motive that's probably connected with the same sorts of struggles that we see uh, in wild animals where two males will get into a contest, you know, to see who gets a girl, usually. Uh, but but being vindicated when something like that turns up, uh, what it says to me is um, I, I look at it and say, yep, there it is, proven again. One thing that's unique about your standing and your role in wrestling has been uh, it goes back to sports, not necessarily wrestling, but you mentioned Lafayette College. Well, and then you mentioned Lehigh. These are two schools about 30 minutes apart from one another that have a fierce rivalry and a respect and a reverence and a, uh, I guess, a, a um, snidish type of relationship, if that is a word, where, you know, y you respect them, but you also want to beat them. It's like, yeah, OK, but when you put all this stuff together together. These wrestling historians, there seems to be a theme. You're a Lafayette guy. Then you've got Jay Hammond was a Lehigh guy. Danny Deal's a Lehigh guy. Gimp is a Lehigh guy. How, does, how do Lehigh guys and Lafayette guys, you know, coexist in this world of wrestling? Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, and I'll give you my answer, which uh, I'd probably be criticized by some of my friends for answering this way. But I have the unusual experience that I got an undergraduate degree from Lafayette, but I also did graduate work at Lehigh. And I mentioned earlier how I ended up going to Lafayette in connection with football. The group of people that was recruited that year that I started, uh, we still brag about the fact that we never lost a game to Lehigh. Uh, there, that rivalry is a really an incredible rivalry. They played the 150th time in football just recently, and they rented Yankee Stadium for the game and sold it out uh, because uh, the whole Lafayette Lehigh thing, if you get into that part of Pennsylvania, everybody knows about it and talks about it. But for me, uh, in view of the fact that I was a Lafayette grad and yet I was so close to the coaching staff, and that also meant the various wrestlers uh, at Lehigh, and and the friendships I formed at Lehigh are incredible. Mike Caruso, for example, um, and I were neighbors for years, and and I cite Mike Caruso and Pete Davidson as two people that became among my closest friends as a direct result of the fact that I was caught up with the Lehigh team, even though I was a Lafayette man, and they they. Um, some of the uh, Lehigh alum will say to me, I was a member of the Lehigh Home Club, which is the club that really supports the team. And, and they would say to me at home club gatherings, they'd say, you know, we tolerate you as long as you're doing that stuff for amateur wrestling news. If you ever stop that, don't expect to be welcome here. 
That wasn't a John Harmon threat, was it? <laughs> uh, no, Harmon, gosh, I had it. When you think about all those guys you, that you just mentioned, Jay Hammond and uh, Denny Dale and John Harmon and uh, Gimp, uh, when I think about how close I got to those people, it, it, uh, it's a wonderful part of my life to have had that experience. Absolutely superb people. Yeah, I got to give the, give them a little little tap a tip of the cap too because uh you know Denny's always a guy that with his Lehigh University wrestling newsletter he, he's not afraid to tell it like you know what he thinks it is and there's been times where you know have I've had to coordinate the rankings and I'll be like Denny this I'd have to email that's not what happened you know it's it's you know but they <laughs> they've always been really really grateful uh you know uh, you know as far as you know being around they've always been very respectful and and obviously grateful for what I've been doing as a person so uh you know what you're saying there I can definitely see even though there's there's probably some decades in between but uh, that crew has definitely made uh, made things a lot easier from a guy like who like you wants to learn more about the sport of wrestling now, as i move forward and we we talk about the role that you still have i mean as a historian you're in your 80s you're still writing but you've also been in 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 the the annals of of wrestling lore forever including two Awards named after Bob Dellinger winning the Bob Dellinger Award from AWN in 1978, a full year before I was even born, and then again recently in 2014. And I am, as much as I've done research, most of my research has been on stats. I'm trying to uh, accumulate all Americans in lists and lists and lists and build a mu- uh, all these lists and reference points. Bob Dellinger is a name that, even though he kind of set the standard for wrestling journalism back in the day, I don't know much about him because I haven't had the chance to sit down and really research his background. I know some of the stories, but what did Bob really mean to the sport of wrestling and, and the way wrestling journalism has evolved? And, you know, where would we be if we didn't have a guy like Bob uh, who's got a, a name aptly named after him? Well, uh, uh, Bob and I became Bob and I became very, very close personal friends. Uh, the uh, putting it in context, I have to r- remind uh, myself when talking to you that all this time I was single. I didn't have a family to go home to. And Bob and Doris uh, invited me into their home as if I was a member of the family. So I got to know them simply because his love for the sport was so great that he recognized my love for the sport, and we had something to share. But he, um, in in those days, Oklahoma uh, had a wonderful tradition underway of high school wrestling, but the, there was newspaper rivalry between Oklahoma City and Tulsa. The paper in Tulsa was the world. There were a couple of papers in Oklahoma City, but Bob Bob's background was as sports writer uh, for, and he covered all sports for Oklahoma City newspaper, and he uh, became the guy who people relied upon for factual information because he had access to the archives of the newspaper. That was where he started, and at the time. He was getting involved in it. There really wasn't anybody at Oklahoma A&M that was keeping track, you might say, doing what you do, statistical work. Uh, they, the attitude at Oklahoma A&M was uh, the Oklahoma A&M and Oklahoma University relationship was very much like Lafayette and Lehigh in the way I saw it. Uh, they respected each other, but yet at the same time, any athletic contest between the two of them was uh, not only a major betting issue, but it could lead uh, to a major argument if you got one fact going up against somebody else's alternate fact. And the ability of Bob to... uh, be able to describe he was a wonderful writer and so was Doris uh, the, the ability to describe things in such a way as to make it appear that he wasn't biased uh, was the major asset he had and I learned that from him uh, and I, you know you're, you're talking you 
brought Denny and Denny Dio into the conversation. Denny does a good job of that. Uh, I I think he uh, exemplifies the spirit that that uh, Bob exemplified, and that is, if you describe it properly and convey a little bit of respect, even though uh, the the uh, people you're writing about are not your favorites, you will be respected for it because people see that. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you a good example of that. I have um, a very good buddy of mine who wrestled at Cornell by the name of Buzzy Bishop, and I get uh, Denny's email all the time. But Buzzy also gets it. And then Buzzy, who doesn't know I get it, forwards it to me. And he forwards it to me because he thinks that there's a chance I will miss something that Denny has said. But yet, he's all caught up in the Cornell program. Buzzy is. He's very much caught up in the Cornell program. And I notice, for example, and you're probably right on top of this, but Rob Call, uh, coaching at Cornell, uh, and does a really good job of circulating his own newsletter, which is the basis from which somebody like Dellinger, the two of them, uh, are able to do the running that they do. As we move on and, and look at the, the world of wrestling as it is today, I, it's, it, I spent, I think, three years putting together all the All-Americans from uh, what we now just simply call Fargo. A lot of that started with Mike Chapman's book, The Encyclopedia of American Wrestling. And then I, I went through the stacks of amateur wrestling news at the Hall and then the ones we had at USA Wrestling while I was there and finished up with like Gary Abbott's press releases that were actually you know in binders in his office when I was there. And, and that even with the work that guys like Mike Chapman did in documenting this stuff and putting it into a book, you know, that that book stops in 1988 and then we've got a gap until probably 95 and there was still a time to go through. And I'm curious on your thoughts, having been through all this this innovation of typewriters to to computers to now just the Internet as a whole and reporting. What is the value of in your opinion, for people that are in their their 20s, 30s, in, in their teens, to understand the history of the sport, to read about the history of the sport. Because every time I pick up an old AWN from something you wrote or something that Jess Hoke wrote or something that even Chapman wrote when he was contributing or Rob Sherrill, I mean, a lot of people know these names, but there are just stories in there that these type of stories don't get told anymore. Uh, why should, uh, you know, I mean, maybe if it's not print, but you think – um, we as a generation need to do more reading about this great sport. Um, geez, Jason, I'm not sure I have an answer. I, um, I'm kind of, I might as well be very candid with you. I'm a bit, um, I'm, I'm not happy with the sport it is in today uh, for a couple reasons. I, it's actually more than a couple reasons. I could probably recite a dozen, but. One thing I think is that, and I think many people would agree with me about this, I think the the officials, the way the rules are now written, and I'm talking both international rules and also college rules and high school rules, uh, are written in such a way that the official on the mat with the wrestlers has too much control over the action. This was done, these rule changes that produced this situation were made deliberately because there were matches in which nothing happened. If two people were of equal ability and neither one wanted to risk anything, you could have an awful boring confrontation of of two guys just standing there staring at each other. And that happened a lot. So they decided to change the rules to add action and speed it up, and they empowered the official to be the person to control that. That was a good idea, but I frankly, I think it's gone too far. And so if I were to make changes, I, I, I often say to people, why don't we go back to pins only count? Skip the scoring system. Go right back to 
You either get a fall or you get pinned, one of the two. Uh, but, you know, from what I told you a minute ago, that is the mentality that I started with, so I, it's hard for me to shed that. And another thing I have to say is a, a negative element in my mind right now is that we've made incredible progress with high school wrestling. When I was first brought toward this sport, I would venture to say I couldn't guess, but I think half of the 48 states didn't really have a lot of wrestling activity. And now I think there's almost too much wrestling activity because the whole idea of it for high school level was to have it be supported after you got out of high school to allow young men to continue wrestling. And the opportunity to do that is less today, Jason, than it was in the 50s. Uh, in the 50s, for example, I think every major city in the United States had a YMCA team. Uh, you have to look around these days to try and find one. But, of course, people... Uh, today are not as oriented to continuing something like wrestling after they end their period of education, whatever that may be, uh, because, uh, after all, cutting weight is, is not fun. <laughs> I never had to do it, but uh, except uh, at one point there was an Olympic weight of 213 and a half pounds, and I could make that weight. It took a little cutting, but basically I never had to cut weight. But when you look at what some of these young people are being asked to do to cut weight year after year, uh, that's got to get old. So uh, I would, I'd say that um, reading about the way it was, which is the original theme here that you wanted to address, might encourage more people to want to put it back further in the direction the way it once was, as opposed to the way it is now. And uh, I really think that would improve the sport. I think it would, uh, I think it'd be a greater sense of accomplishment for the individual too. If you thought that you won a match by skill instead of by, lucking through a move that the officials thought was worth more points than, than you did. Uh, I don't Did I express myself well on that point? I hope I did. Yeah, because what it does is it reminds me, I had uh, John Irving on the program about a year and a half ago, and he talked about when he was done with uh, wrestling at Pittsburgh and he was coaching and he was doing his writing, he would go into the New York AC and still work out, even into his, you know, his late 30s, early 40s. So he was still you know, trying to compete and, and those, those opportunities. Now we only see, uh, we see a veterans nationals in folk style, which is in, in March. And then we have the freestyle in Greco and in, in usually April. And that's pretty much it for the veterans calendar. But uh, you know, yeah, the, the YMC thing, YMCA thing, that's always intrigued me because you look at the old, you know, even the Midlands back going into the late sixties in the sixties, when they started up, you're seeing, you know, the, the, you know, LaGrange YMCA, you know, there, there are teams that are a Chicago mayor daily wrestling club. This stuff is popping up and there were names post-college wrestling for those things. So that's an interesting thing. As we wrap up, I'm just, again, I'm just enamored with the whole uh, historical aspect of this. And with all of the things, I mean, first of all, how many stories do you think you've written documenting this thing? Cause I'm looking, I don't know how many it did with say 15 editions times, you say you've probably been writing for 40 of the 60 years, right? They're, they're, give or take, or has it been longer than that? No, I, I definitely know it was it, when it was. Uh, and I have number one, but I can't remember where I put it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I've, it's been decades. Let's, let's put it that way. I've been doing it for decades. And I don't know how many I've written. I asked, I asked John Hoke one time if there was any way to count them, and and we talked about the fact that at at one point there were other publications, too. I wrote for other publications. Uh, for example, the AAU had a magazine. Uh, that I just cite that as a case where uh, they welcomed this kind of stuff. I don't know how many I've written, but I, when people ask me, I always say hundreds. 
I think you're closing in on the thousands because if you do that, you figure if there's 15, 15 editions uh, times 50 years, that's 750 right there. And then you say over the last 50 years, you've probably, uh, you know, 50, 55, 60 years written more than just, you know, two one offs a year. I'd say it's pretty safe to say you've, you've written over a thousand stories, you know, on, on the history of wrestling. I'd say that's a pretty, pretty fair assessment. Well, yeah, I'm going to make a point um, which you can relate to. Uh, having done a lot of writing and having got to know professional writers, um, the the element of what you get paid for what you do makes a big difference. And in my case, I'm actually proud of the fact that I never got paid to write for Amateur Wrestling News. I'm very proud of it. When I spoke to Jess about the idea, he said to me on day one, if you do that, I will give you a free subscription. <laughs> and that's what I've been working for all this time. So, <laughs> Well, you were if, single, right? You, you could afford it. <laughs> I, I did. I did. had no family. That's it. And, and uh, so when I look back now and, and think about uh, that deal I made with him, uh, I'm proud of it. I really am proud of it. And and uh, the uh, whole Hulk family has uh, been like uh, parents to me, you might say. You know, he, he was the seventh son of a seventh son. Very unusual um, genealogical fact. And he... Um, he worked at... A, you know, his background, maybe you know this, but uh, he worked... Uh, in the mechanical part of uh, newspaper business, which is uh, very significant in those days, but doesn't mean as much now because uh, computers do so much of it. Are you talking but John or Jess? John. I'm, yeah. I'm, I mean, okay. Jess. I'm talking about Jess. Yeah. Um, and he represents a case just like me in which uh, he was fascinated and there wasn't anything published, and so he started that. And Today, uh, people like you have picked up the uh, banner, so to speak, and done a really good job of keeping it going. But as far as the future is concerned, it is a case where the differences in the sport are sufficient to make it a, a situation where knowing about the way it used to be doesn't do you any good because it was different then. Uh, that bothers me a lot. I think about that often. So if you were to go back and, and recall some of your, your greatest, I realize I'm, that's all, that's probably a lofty question. So maybe uh, boil it down to some of the more memorable things or, or aha moments. Like say you're in a library somewhere and you discover, you unearth this factoid that, you know, I, I do this all the time where I'll, I'll find something and I'll be like, I'll turn to my wife and I will be like, I'll just geek out about this cool stat that I've, that I've unearthed based on my research. And she's, I mean, she's, she's like, okay, yeah, that's nice. That's nice. Uh, continue on with your stats. But you know, we've, we've got that moment when we think like this, what are some of the cooler things that you've discovered over the years that ultimately like you felt like made an impact and changed something based on just your own research, whether it be at a library or combing through an old magazine or, or a foreign newspaper or something of, of that sort. Well, I'm, I'm going to give you one example because it's the only one that occurs to me right now. Uh, and maybe if I had the time to sit and think about it, I could come up with a dozen more easily. But right now I can only think of one because it just happened just now. Um, what it, what it, um, what it originated with was a question I got from somebody about a Lehigh wrestler named Henry Mathis, M-A-T-T-H-E-S, I'm pretty sure, who was an EIWA champ for Lehigh. And the question that was asked of me was, what was his wrestling achievement before he won the EIWA championship? I didn't know, and so I went to people that I was pretty sure did know. Uh, you know, I'm talking about people like Denny. And 
what I discovered was nobody knew. And that intrigued me. So I started to research the whole idea of this guy. And the end of the story is that he apparently was a walk on. <laughs> and uh, he didn't wrestle during the dual season. Or if he came up to the wrestling room and worked out, it, they didn't record who was in the room ever. But apparently the regular guy at that weight got injured and they had to put in a name for the EIWA championship and somehow his name got put in and and he won. And I cannot find a trace of him ever wrestling before that. So this is a guy that, this is a big aha. Somehow, somewhere, I'm going to learn more about this person because that is unusual. Well, anyway, I cite that as an example, as an aha. Yeah, I'm curious about that. What year was that? Um, you're challenging me now. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not at my desk. <laughs> um, I could probably email you. I'll tell you. Well, what was that? What, you know, what era? What decade? Are we talking? Well, ask, ask Denny. Uh, Denny knows. <laughs> we talking we're, the... we're talking about the the. the um, if I recall, late thirties, early forties. Okay. I, okay. Yeah. Right. Cause that's, that's, that's yeah. one and, of the curiosities. <laughs> yeah. And, and one other aha that I want to tell you about, um, Egyptology is a science that was evolved when the Brits and the French first started to go into Egypt and, look at these ancient monuments. Egypt at that time was in control by the Ottoman Empire. And the idea of learning more about the ancient Egyptians was not a popular idea in a Muslim civilization. Consequently, the Egyptians themselves and also the Ottomans knew very little about the ancient Egyptians. And the British and the French scholars filled that vacuum by doing a lot of research. Uh, fast forward to the aha moment. Just recently online, I, I saw a digitized example of somebody that wrote something a long time ago, 150 years ago, about Egypt that I had never seen before. And I thought I knew all of the literary sources, but I'd never seen this. And it had to do with moving a big stone statue how they did it, and uh, apparently somebody has translated a hieroglyphic document explaining how they did it. And the sentence that jumped out at me was that when the time came to move the statue, they had to get every wrestler in the land because they wanted all the strongest people. And then there's a picture of what looks like a couple hundred guys pulling on ropes to move this thing. And I thought to myself, boy, there's a case where they knew who the wrestlers were. And this is 3,000 years ago. So uh, there's, that's, a, for me, a big aha. And, and because there is a picture of it online, I haven't had anything that I've had in wrestling news for a while because I've been a little sick. Uh, but I thought, I, that's the next thing I'm going to write up is talking about moving this statue with the wrestlers. Uh, anyway, those are the only two that occur to me right now, Jason. You know, we've been talking with Don Sayanga, wrestling historian, longtime writer and contributor for Amateur Wrestling News, a member of the Lafayette College Athletic Hall of Fame, where he wrestled at two NCAA championships back in 55 and 56. And Don, in the, the time we got left on the program, I could probably go another two and a half, three hours talking about history, but I'll, I will, we'll, we'll, we'll have to table this. We'll pick it up for another episode because there's a bunch of things I still want to pick your brain about in the future. But uh, for, for those interested, uh, you know, any final thoughts about why the sport of wrestling has, has been so great to you over the years and, and the good things that you've learned from the people in it? Uh, I'll, one, one sentence answer. <clears throat> I, I mentioned that my health hasn't been good, but I've been subjected to an awful lot of medical examinations lately. I'm 82 years old. And a week and a half ago, a medical professional said to me, if I didn't know you were sick, I'd never know you were sick because your health and physical condition is so good. And I attribute that to wrestling, which I kept up as long as I possibly could. 
So I recommend it to anybody who wants to live a long and healthy life. Uh, it's a good way to approach it. It certainly gives you more exercise in golf. I'm not kidding, folks. I probably would have spent four to five hours on the phone with Don Sienga if it wasn't for the purposes of this show. It is the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, which in some cases does last a long time. This episode, over one hour, but we'd like to thank you. Actually, we, being me, would like to thank you for spending each and every second of your wrestling day with me for this show and the various shows on the Mad Talk Podcast Network. Big news coming. Uh, well, big-ish news. We've got a new show coming to the network on November 4th. That is a Friday. So at 8 a.m. Eastern Time on Friday morning, November 4th, Black Shoe Diaries. Yeah, the Penn State SB Nation, uh, basically a fan blog network of fan sites. And uh, Clay Sauerteig and Garrett Carr will be bringing the Black Shoe Diaries Penn State Wrestling Podcast to the Matt Talk Podcast Network. This is uh, a little different than what you'll hear from the shows that I have with Old Dominion, Buena Vista, and Virginia Tech. This is a fan show. It is not a, a school-sponsored show, but it's definitely, these guys have a lot of insight on Penn State Wrestling, so you will be able to hear that as part of SB Nation and as part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. I'm curious if you can hear that in the background right now. Let's see. Can you hear it? Anyway, it's like nursery rhymes. I've got my youngest daughter in a uh, in a rocking chair with my oldest daughter playing iPad as the nanny has just left as I record this in the afternoon. So on Thursdays, nanny leaves at three and I wasn't quite done with the work because uh, I talked to Don for an hour. But uh, yeah, that's uh, I tell you that, that, that iPad was actually supposed to be mine from two summers ago when I was a stay at home dad. I was working from home, but. You know, in lieu of a nanny, uh, my wife went to work. I was pretty much working from home anyway, but I, I basically didn't work for uh, most of the day because I was watching Lucy when she was younger. So I did the stay at home dad thing for, you know, four months. That thing, that's tough. So parenting is tough. Wrestling stuff, but parenting, man, that is really tough. And I can, like, guys like Jordan Burroughs who like try to parent and wrestle and uh, things of that nature. Yeah, if you're a wrestler and a parent, more power to you, especially if you're an active active parent. And, and how about props to the wives? My wife is a saint. She puts up with all my travel, which actually begins this weekend. I have been on a travel ban since I got back from the Olympic Games, and that fires back up this weekend. Uh, again, as you listen to this, I record it on November 3rd, 2016, heading down to preseason nationals. In Waterloo, Cedar Falls at the Unidome, we'll be announcing that on the PA. Brian Keck calling me up, said, hey, I'd like to bring you down. So I'll be making a couple-hour drive down, checking out some high school wrestling to kick off the year. NWC All-Star Classic is this weekend. You can watch that on trackwrestling.com. Also in the news, Brent Metcalf, now been named the new National Freestyle Development Coach. Check that information out at themat.com. Of course, he is filling the position that was vacated by Bill Zadick, who is now the U.S. National Team Coach in Freestyle. And that's Ruby. She's enjoying things. I think she's sneezing. Anyway, mommy will be home in a second. So I'm trying to trying to get this this post show out before uh, the baby starts crying. So uh, I don't know if this is bad parenting or not, but she's she's good to go. Hold on, Ruby. Daddy, be right there. You know, it won't be right there. End of the show right now. Kid takes precedence. <laughs> if you like the show, I'd like to thank you for spending your time with me. If you like the show, you can contribute madtalkonline.com slash join the team. Hit me up at Jason M. Bryant or at Matt Talk Online on Twitter. Uh, that's all I got. Baby's crying. Got to go feed it. Later. Thank you for spending your time with me because you've always got time for short time and I got to spend my time with my kid. Bye. is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.